We'll hear argument in 08-1438, uh, Sossaman versus Texas. You didn't look like Mr. Schnapp. <laughs> Mr. Russell. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. By accepting federal funds for its prisons, Texas consented to suit for appropriate relief for violations of the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. The question in this case is whether that appropriate relief encompasses damages. If you simply asked what kind of relief is generally appropriate against a state, the answer would be no relief, not even an injunction, because states ordinarily are not subject even to suit without their consent. And so RELUPA necessarily asks a more precise question, and that is, what relief is appropriate against a state that has consented to be sued for violations of this sort? Damages, for example, are perfectly appropriate against a state that has consented to be sued for breach of contract. How, what would it be, Mr. Russell, if there were a suit under RIFRA uh, because a federal penal in- institution was not allowing for the religious practices that the Act protects. In a suit under RIFRA, could there be, would damages be an appropriate remedy? In our view, they are, although it's a different context, and, and, and we recognize that the government disagrees with us on that. We can't point to the spending clause contract analogy that applies with respect to spending clause legislation as RIFRA applies uh, to the federal government. But there are other indications, including, for example, the long tradition of damages being appropriate relief for the violation of the Well, can we back up a minute? You're saying you could get them against the federal government, too, but the government doesn't think so. That is our view, although we recognize that that RELUPA is different in, in this respect in that it's a spending clause statute under which, and this Court's decision, Barnes v. Gorman, makes clear that damages are a traditionally appropriate uh, relief for the violation of any spending clause statute. Of course, there's also a tradition uh, that damages are appropriate for the violation of civil rights. Uh, Take statutes like Title VI, Title VII, Title IX, Section 504, the ADA. The list goes on and on where Congress has created damages as the the quintessential remedy to, to enforce civil rights. And when Congress has subjected states to suits under such statutes, it has always put them on equal footing with other defendants and subjected them to damages as well. But even beyond uh, that, that. But did it use such language as appropriate relief? Well, for example. I mean, that's the question. Our, our cases say it has to be clear to the state. When they, when they go into one of these schemes, it has to be clear what liability they're subjecting themselves to. And in these other cases, I think it was clear. I don't think it's clear with simply the word appropriate relief. No, we're not saying that the word appropriate relief in itself supplies the clarity. It's, it's looking at that language and the way the Court interprets statutes generally, among other things, looking at the tradition of what constitutes appropriate relief for a violation of this sort. And we do think that Barnes versus Foreman is appropriate uh, precedent in, in telling the Court, in telling Texas, what kind of relief is generally thought appropriate uh, to uh, satisfy uh, Congress's desire to remedy violations of a spending clause statute. We recognize, of course, that Barnes didn't involve sovereign defendants, but the s- local governments in that case had the same rights as a state would. It just comes out of the spending clause rather than the 11th Amendment. That is, both constitutional provisions prohibit Congress from subjecting uh, defendants to damages suits under spending clause leg- legislation without their consent. And this Court has enforced that identical constitutional right with the same clear statement test derived from Pennhurst versus Holderman. Even more, you know, the contract analogy the Court relied on in Barnes is no less apt simply because one of the recipients is a state. Well, the contract analogy, I suppose, would provide that the meaning of the contract is interpreted against the drafter, right? The, well, that, that would have been true in Barnes as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so to the extent the state is arguing for a restrictive interpretation, it gets at least a little help from the fact that the federal government wrote the statute. Well, it gets the same amount of help as the local governments got in Barnes, which wasn't enough. Um, and not only does the analogy, I think, apply, so does the remedy. Damages are a quintessential appropriate remedy for breach of contract by a state, so long as the state has agreed uh, to be sued for violation of a contract. Mr. Russell, if a state looks at this uh, statute and says, oh, this statute uh, preserves uh, the PLRA, and under the PLRA, there are no damages 
without having a physical injury. So putting the PLRA together with appropriate relief, PLRA is telling us is not appropriate relief when there's no physical injury. Well, I would say two things about that. One, keep in mind that the PLRA limitations only apply to incarcerated individuals. It doesn't apply to, to the people who LUPA protects in state-run nursing homes or mental health facilities. And so Congress wouldn't have been thinking uh, that appropriate relief is defined in some sense by the scope of the PLRA. In addition, we think the fact that, that Congress expressly said that the PLRA applies to limit the relief that's otherwise available under uh, RELUPA shows that Congress didn't think uh, that the PLRA itself made uh, the relief un- inappropriate. It's simply that there is some relief that's otherwise appropriate that will be limited in some circumstances by the PLRA. But in the prison setting, then, isn't it an academic question because they're not going to be damages anyway? No, that's, that's not true for, for a couple of reasons. One, there are many cases involving pecuniary damages. There's destruction of religious items that won't be subject to the PLRA limitation. There are, there are, there are cases that give rise to pecuniary claims. So there's destruction of, of a religious item, a Bible or something like that. Uh, there are also cases in which the violation will uh, result in a physical injury. There are cases where people are deprived of food for, for long periods of time. Uh, there's a case uh, where a prison refused to transport an inmate uh, for medical treatment outside of the facility because he wouldn't take off his yarmulke. Um, Congress, I, I don't think, would have thought that the PLRA limitations rendered uh, a damages remedy uh, unimportant. And at the very least, excuse me? Does it include punitive damages? Uh, the statute, I think, does not in light of Barnes, because Barnes said that uh, you get traditional contract remedies and, and punitive damages are not a traditional contract remedy. Beyond that tradition, though, there's also textual cues in the statute itself. There are, there are three of them that I'd like to focus on. I'll list them and, and then discuss them. One is the definition section, which lumps states in together with local governments in the definition of government. The second is the, the federal enforcement provision, which specifically allows suits by the United States, but only for the equitable uh, and declaratory relief uh, that the state says is the only thing that's available under appropriate relief. And finally is the fact that the statute separately already authorizes suits for injunctive relief against state officials, uh, making the addition of suits against states effectively surplusage unless uh, some other kind of relief is available against the state. Beginning with the definition section, uh, this Court recognized in the United States versus Nordic Village that where Congress in the Bankruptcy Act defined governmental unit to include both the United States and a state, that Congress was making clear, quote, that states and federal sovereigns are to be treated the same for immunity purposes. And I think the same lesson comes out of the fact that RELUPA defines governments to include not only states but local governments and subjects all governments to the same cause of action for the same appropriate relief. Congress was expressing there, as clear as it could, uh, that, that there was a definitional equivalence between states and local government. Yeah, but, but that, I mean, that, that means either that the federal government, that the state government is liable for damages just as municipalities are, or that municipalities are immune to suit for damages just as the states are. I mean, that, you don't know which way that cuts. Well, I'll point you to other provisions of the uh, statute well, that maybe let's talk about shed some light. Okay. <laughs> One is the fact uh, that, uh, as I mentioned before, the statute, and, and I think the state agrees, already allows suits for injunctive relief against uh, state officials in their official capacity. The only thing uh, that adding states as defendant would accomplish in light of that would simply be a change in the caption of the lawsuit unless states are subject to some relief uh, that state officials under Ex parte Young are not. Um, and well, except this would be a violation of the statute, not a violation of a constitutional right. So under Ex parte Young, um, they couldn't necessarily get an injunction. Well, I would set aside the question of whether Ex parte Young applies of its own force. I think mm-hmm. by defining uh, officials as a form of government and authorizing suits for appropriate relief against the officials, I think everybody agrees uh, that that authorizes suits against the officials uh, for at least injunctive relief. And then the question is, well, what, what does it accomplish to also authorize suits against states? And, and I think the obvious answer is that, is that it authorizes a damages claim against this state. And, and even in light of Barnes, the, the state seems to acknowledge that damages are appropriate relief against local governments under the Well, state. well I, I can conceive of a case where, where the state's violation of RELIPA uh, consists of a, of a state statute 
that simply deprives the individual of, uh, of his rights under RELIPA. What state official would you, would you sue? Uh, it seems to me you couldn't sue the state legislature, so it would make sense to have a, uh, an injunction against the state. I think it's common in that circumstance to sue the state attorney general for ex parte young relief, for example, if you have a constitutional claim against the statute, as may very well have happened in the California case, or the governor, I guess. Um, and so I, I don't think uh, that naming, having a state as a defendant is necessary for that purpose here. In addition, as I mentioned before, I think that even the state acknowledges that damages are appropriate relief against local governments. Um, but Congress made clear that, that when it intended the identity of a party to result in a, a dramatically different scope of relief, it did so expressly. Uh, and you can see that in the U.S. enforcement provision. There, Congress uh, specially authorized suits by the United States and, and had its own remedial provision, which provides only for declaratory and injunctive relief. And that shows both that Congress uh, didn't expect courts to simply figure out that different kinds of defendants should be subject to different appropriate relief. Well, but also, that, isn't it argued that uh, a possible purpose of that was to make it clear that uh, the federal government couldn't sue a state to recover money that had been given to it? Well, the fact uh, I would say two things about that. One is uh, Congress didn't limit uh, that provision to suits against states. It's anybody who gets sued by the United States is limited to equitable injunctive relief. And that's, again, an example of Congress treating states the same as everybody else. Whether they're sued by the United States or sued by a private party, it's the same relief. It's the same remedial provision. And we think that suggests the same relief. Um, that provision also, kind of the language of that provision, injunctive or declaratory relief, stands in pretty stark contrast to the facially broader phrase, uh, appropriate relief in, in the general provision. In addition to RELUPA itself, I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, the state had independent notice under Section 2007. Is, this is the Rehabilitation Act Amendments of 1986, where Congress made clear to Texas that it would be subject to suit for damages under any uh, statute that — under the section of any statute that prohibits uh, discrimination by federal funding recipients. And I think the question here boils down to whether uh, RELUPA is materially distinguishable from Section 504 which is listed in Section 2000-D7 as an example of a, of a statute of uh, prohibiting discrimination. Uh, and if uh, — I think that means that the catch-all has to at least be broad enough to encompass Section 504. And in our view, uh, the two statutes are not distinguishable. Both prohibit both the kind of uh, disparate treatment of similarly situated individuals that the State acknowledges constitutes discrimination and requires uh, accommodations in some circumstances. You, you addressed the implicate the, the — effect of, of the issue here on uh, persons who are in state institutions other than penal institutions. Uh, what would be — what's the effect of the issue here on land use restrictions? Are there many cases in which uh, issues involving land use restrictions are uh, are raised in litigation against a state as opposed to a municipality? It's quite rare. I'm aware of one pending case in Vermont where there's a challenge to a, a state environmental uh, regulation. Uh, but for the most part, it isn't. But, you know, if this Court were to, you know, the section — the provision that we're talking about here applies to land use as well as to institutionalized persons. Um, and one would ordinarily think that the, the statute would have the same meaning uh, depending on context. I, I recognize that the state's basic argument is that the meaning changes depending on who the defendant is. And I, I suppose if you accept that, it could also depend on, on what provision is being applied. But that's not normally how statutes work. But the answer to, the, to Justice Alito's question is that in the land use area, zoning, for example, those are mostly cases against municipalities or counties. That is correct. Not against the state. That is correct. The, the government is, is going to tell us that the standard for waiver with respect to f the federal government is different from the standard with respect to the state. Do you — I think that's what they're going to tell us. Do you agree with that? No, I actually don't understand them to be making that argument either, but I, I know for sure that that's not our position. Uh, and then the, the Court's decision in Barnes, I think, uh, for example, is, is entirely consistent with the Court's recent decisions, including, for, for example, in Richland, where it's, it's made clear that when you're considering the scope 
of, of a, a waiver of sovereign immunity. Uh, you engage in ordinary statutory interpretation, and then the sovereign is respected if, at the end of that uh, interpretation, the statute remains unclear. You know, certainly the sovereign wins. But, uh, in a but case it seems to me that the states are in need of special protection. Uh, with with the Congress, uh, if it's a federal immunity, the Congress can always always change its laws. Well, I, that, that just can't happen with the state. I don't know that this court's cases support the idea that that, that there's a heightened clear statement rule for states versus the federal government. If anything, I think they suggest the opposite. But so long as, as the statute is clear, it's the suggestion of the opposite that that, that, I, that I'm trying uh, okay. I'm trying to explore. But I'll, I'll, you have your white light on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russell. <clears throat> Ms. Harrington. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, the respondent in this case agrees that when it accepts federal funds for its correctional system, it voluntarily waives its sovereign immunity to private suits in federal court to enforce RELUPA. And it is clear under this Court's decisions in cases such as Franklin and Barnes that that voluntary waiver encompasses a waiver to suits for money damages. Suppose Congress passes a statute that creates a private right of action against both the federal government and against the states, and in both instances authorizes all appropriate relief. Are damages available in the action against the federal government as well as the state government? Well, it would depend on the context to answer both questions. Um, well, the state, the state provision is a spending clause provision. Then the answer would be yes as to the states. This Court has been clear in cases such as Franklin and Barnes than in the spending clause context, unless Congress indicates an intent to rebut the presumption somehow. But what about the federal government? And the federal government, probably not, although this Court has looked to background principles in interpreting words such as appropriate. What, what sense does that make, other than I know you're representing a client, and so special pleading for your client is is to be expected, but I, I find that very difficult to accept. If all appropriate relief includes damages as against a state that uh, accepts federal money, then, you know, what's good for the state should be good for the federal government. Well, I'd say two things. First, in both cases, what you want is the clear statement of an intent to waive the sovereign's immunity, either by the federal government or the state government. And also that it's important to keep in mind that in cases such as Franklin and Barnes, this Court was construing statutes that did not say anything about what, are, what remedies were appropriate, didn't mention remedies whatsoever. Um, and so we don't rely so much on RELUPA's use of the phrase appropriate relief as we do on the spending clause context. But those cases wouldn't, did not involve states, right? Those cases did not involve states, that's true. And, but, and I think that the, the, the core question here is, the state, as Justice Alito just posed it, the state is being treated with less dignity than the federal government because your position is that the federal government is shielded by its sovereign immunity and you say the state is not. On the contrary, as to the dignity point, Your Honor, the, it's, the state voluntarily waives its immunity when it accepts federal funds that clearly condition the acceptance of the funds on the waiver of its immunity. The state in this case doesn't contest that it has waived its sovereign immunity voluntarily to some universe of suits to enforce But we're talking about general principles of interpretation, and the proposition that we're suggesting is, is the state surely should be entitled to the same dignity, the same protection against suits as the federal government, and you suggest just the opposite. No, Your Honor. And it seems to me that that's contrary to standard principles of, of the federal ba of protecting the federal balance. If you were construing a state statute that voluntarily waived its own immunity, then you might we might say the use of appropriate relief in that statute should be construed the same as the use of appropriate relief in RIFRA. But in this case, we're not talking about a state's waiver of its immunity through a, through statutory language. The court said in College Savings Bank that when a when a state takes federal funds that are conditioned on a waiver of immunity, it is the act of accepting the funds that is the waiver, and it waives its immunity to suits to the extent that it has noticed that but it is it's, doing so. But it's only because they accept the, the funds at all that the, spending op, that the spending clause is even operative. That's right. But again, it's, it's the act of the accepting the funds that are clearly conditioned that constitutes the waiver. So the, federal the waiver, I mean, the state side, they can say it says appropriate relief. All right, we accept that we're going to be 
vulnerable to an injunction suit. But with the State and its uh, Treasury, and it's not appropriate relief, we didn't waive it. It's not — doesn't say in the, in the Spending Clause legislation that we open up our Treasury. But there's no basis in either the Eleventh Amendment or the statutory provisions in RELUPA for distinguishing relief of an injunctive nature from relief and damages against the State. The Eleventh Amendment talks about suits in law and in equity, and there's nothing in RELUPA that would give the States notice that they are waiving their immunity to suits for injunctive relief, but not give them notice that they're waiving their immunity to suits for money damages. This Court, again — The word appropriate would would suggest that to me if if I'm a — State Attorney General, and, and I know that uh, the rule is sovereign immunity, and, uh, and and especially with regard to raids on the state treasury, I think it'd be at least plausible that I would I would read uh, appropriate relief, not to include monetary relief. And, and we have said uh, the, the language uh, uh, from our cases. Lane says. A waiver of sovereign immunity must be une- unequivocally expressed in the statutory text and will be strictly construed in terms of its scope in favor of the sovereign. But in Lane- so that's a high test. And, and although I might sit down and come out uh, with the conclusion after intensive study that uh, yeah, maybe the best reading of this statute is that it allows money damages, I find it hard to say that it uh, — is unequivocally expressed in the statutory text. Well, two things, if I could, Your Honor. In Lane versus Pena, the question before the Court was — it wasn't — it was outside the spending clause context because the question was whether Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act applied to the Federal Government. And when the Federal Government applies, even in spending clause context, uh, conditions on itself, there's no contract-like relationship. Um, but the second thing, this Court said you, in Barnes — you, you deny that it has to be unequivocal? Uh, it has to be unequivocal, but — but the context in which you're construing whether the, whether the sovereign is expressing its intent to waive its immunity is different when you're talking about the federal government applying uh, obligations on itself than when you're talking about the federal government offering money to a state in, in exchange for its agreeing to what, comply but with But that has nothing to do with whether the language is clear enough to constitute a waiver, and there's no principle of law that you're articulating that says it, it has to be this is not clear enough for the federal government, but it is clear enough for the state. Appropriate relief either has a meaning or it doesn't. Right. And again, we're not repli- relying so much on the use of the phrase appropriate relief in the statute. What that well, — the work that does is it affirms that the background presumption of the Bell v. Hood cases <coughs> applies to de- proper defendants under RELUPA, which includes state governments. But as this Court said in Barnes, when a, f- when a recipient t- of federal funds takes the funds, it's on notice that it is going to be subject not only to the remedies explicitly provided in the text of the relevant legislation, but also to remedies that are traditionally available in suits for breach of contract, and those include compensatory damages and injunctive relief. Uh, the state would have this Court turn that presumption uh, in terms of the uh, — traditional contract rules on its head by saying that this, that this Court should hold that the State presumptively waives its immunity to suits for injunctive relief, but not for damages. What do you say about, uh, some, I think I read in one of these briefs that what I think was the most relevant similar statute, RIFRA, has been held not to encompass uh, the same word, not, not to encompass the uh, monetary relief. And also, there was some legislative history where people testified and told Congress at the time that the word appropriate won't, won't encompass monetary relief. Am I remembering that correctly? Well, I, I would give you the same answer I just gave, which is that we're not pointing so much to the use of the — using the phrase appropriate relief in the statute as we are to the spending clause context. And this Court has held that when there is these conditions placed on federal funds, the recipient of the funds understands when it takes the money that when it intentionally violates the conditions to which it has agreed, it will be subject to suit for money. But then you're, you're bracketing the state with the — with counties and municipalities. And it really comes down to a question is, who decides whether the state fisc is touched? And why isn't it most appropriate for this Court to say, Congress can call it either way, but our rule is, Congress, if you want to reach the state Treasury, you have to say so explicitly. And then, and then there's no doubt when the state enters a contract that it's going to be 
subject to money damages as well as injunctive relief? Well, this Court has consistently applied a clear notice requirement to conditions that Congress places on Federal funds. That clear notice requirement arose out of cases like Pennhurst and South Dakota versus Dole, in which there were State recipients of Federal funds. And the Court said that the the validity of Congress's constitutional action in, in exercising its spending clause authority depends on it giving the recipients of the funds clear notice of the conditions that they are agreeing to because of the contract-like nature um, of spending clause legislation. Now, that same rule was applied in Franklin and Gebser and Davis and Dole. Even though the defendants in those cases were not sovereigns, it's still the same notice requirement. And there's no reason to think that a county government would be able to understand, would be on notice that it would be subject to compensatory damages suits, and a state government would not. To be sure, the state government has more to give up. It might be a harder choice for the state about whether to take the money or not. But the choice is the state's. And when it says, yes, I'm going to take this money, it agrees to the conditions that are attached to the money. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Mr. Ho. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. The phrase appropriate relief is a textbook example of ambiguity, not unmistakable clarity. And that should end the inquiry. After all — If it is, why is injunctive relief included at all? Meaning, what you seem to be saying to me is that no relief should be appropriate because no relief is clear, whether it's injunctive relief or damages. Well, we agree with the U.S. reading of RIFRA. Uh, the, the U.S. is reading with RIFRA. The same should attach here. There is an express cause of action. So that cause of action has to do something. And we're applying to that express cause of action the narrowest reading, which is — Some would say that injunctive relief attaches more to the public fist than com- compensatory relief, because future conduct or the change of conduct can have an enormous intrusion on the public fist. So why do we draw the line between saying one is more intrusive than the other? Two answers, Your Honor. The traditional line drawing that you see in sovereign immunity is injunctive relief, indeed any prospective relief, is less intrusive on sovereign immunity than any form of uh, retrospective relief, uh, damages and that sort of thing. That's especially true in this context, because when you talk about the spending clause, we can walk away from an injunctive relief, uh, from an injunction at any time. We can simply stop receiving the funds, stop accepting the funds, and the injunction evaporates. We can't walk away from a damages remedy. So we're construing the express cause of action uh, in our LUPA, like in RIFRA, to do the judicial minimum, which is that judicial relief, which requires states to do what we're already required to do, which is to comply with the substantial burden mandates <coughs> under our LUPA. So the fact that appropriate relief is essentially inherently ambiguous should end the analysis, because, after all, the Court is required unmistakably clear text and rejected merely permissible inferences for two reasons, to ensure both careful, robust deliberation by Congress before disturbing the federal state uh, balance of power, as well as to ensure clear notice. I I was looking at the cases the best I can at the moment. Uh, I think you might say that there are a lot of cases which interpret the word appropriate relief to include monetary relief. And then there are some that don't. And to get a rule out of them, you'd have to say, well, they're looking to context. And in context, it's sometimes clear, sometimes occasionally not. Uh, But here, isn't this, and maybe this was asked, but I want your answer. Uh, The context here, the words appropriate relief, govern both the prison situation and the land use situation. Don't they? It's, it, you're given a, a, an action when, they, when the government, through a general land use regulation, infringes uh, somebody's uh, right to build, for example. Now, wouldn't that kind of interference with the use of property quite often and normally require uh, uh, some kind of monetary compensation? I mean, this isn't just the odd thing in a, in a uh, prison where it's talking about it might be called building a uh, — uh, building a religious uh, building or building a commu- some kind of uh, parking, all kinds of things that have monetary compensation. You see my question? I, I think I do, Your Honor. First of all, we certainly agree with your premise, mm-hmm. which is that context matters. The Court has said specifically yeah. appropriate relief can enlarge, it can contract. Yeah. Yeah. It can mean monetary, but it can mean not monetary. Mm-hmm. So it does depend on context. 
Uh, I confess uh, your land use question is, is interesting. We're obviously focused on the Section 3 in this I case. know, but isn't it the but same word that governs both? It is the same word. Well, if it's the same word that governs both, and if land cases very often involve claims for money, I would think that would cut against you. Uh, uh, but that's why I ask. I want to get your response. Well, we're, we're still looking for express language in the text. Uh, oh, but there are loads of cases that have nothing more than appropriate relief, and in those cases, context makes it clear. The only one, really, I thought strongly on that your strongest case seemed to me to be RIFRA. Well, R- RIFRA certainly is the direct context from which no. the words appropriate relief in this statute are drawn. And RIFRA, of course, is land use, it's prisons, it's anything. Mm-hmm. RIFRA applies to the federal government or any activity under the sun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, for that reason alone, I think we might resist the notion that the specific uses of appropriate relief in our LUPA would somehow provide any sort of change or, or certainly any expectation that we would have or that Congress would have for that matter, that the words appropriate relief would, would take on a new meaning just because it's land use. Uh, well, I mean, so often what I'm thinking of, a church wants to build and they can't because of a land restriction. And it turns out that that land restriction violates this statute. And in the meantime, they've had to rent buildings. They've had maybe to build somewhere else. They've had to do all kinds of things that cost money. And that's why I would think in that context, money would be a natural thing. I'm not sure uh, that, that would, would feel appropriateness. I'm actually not sure that that, that would be true even in that context. Uh, certainly anybody might want money. But when it comes to what Congress has indicated and what states would expect, uh, I, would, I would imagine that the federal government's biggest interest is in making sure that states and other recipients use the money for what it's supposed to be for, comply with the substantial burden mandate. And if a local government is not doing so with regard to a, a, a church, then they should be enjoined so that they be required to comply with it. If anything, damages might exacerbate the problem just in the sense that we're now taking federal money and, and, and but I thought, damages I thought, from it. I thought a local government would be subject to damages. We're talking about the state. Yeah. We are talking about the state, Your Honor. To be clear, we do not actually concede that damages would even be available against a local government. Our point here is simply that it doesn't matter for us because we obviously are treated very differently uh, from local governments. I think they have both uh, uh, petitioner and the U.S. have indicated that the statute should treat state and locals the same way. The problem with that is the Constitution obviously treats states and locals very differently. The Constitution treats the state and federal government uh, in the same way, in that both uh, enjoy sovereign immunity, and included in that are the principles of sovereign immunity, the need for specific waiver, not just a clear waiver, but specific as to the scope of the waiver and specific as to the remedies. So now we have three distinctions. With respect to land use discrimination, the Rehab Act would presumably apply. So the Rehab Act says compensatory damages are permissible for that kind of discriminatory claim. So now we have compensatory damages for that. We have potentially compensatory damages for local governments, but not for state or federal. We are chopping up the statute at each stage, correct? We're treating different defendants differently and different claims differently with respect to the relief that's permissible. That would not be our submission, Your Honor. Uh, if we're talking about the 2007 language, uh, all that 2007 says is if you are a provision prohibiting discrimination, then you get the same remedies against a state that you would get against any other uh, non-sovereign defendant. And if we were representing the city of Austin, we actually would argue. Uh, we think we'd have good arguments that damages would not be available even against the city of Austin. Our point here is simply that — Could you however, explain why? Sure. I I think if I were the city of Austin, I would make three arguments. One, the words appropriate relief are in the statute. I I think the other side wants to read this as surplusage. We would think that the words appropriate relief should do something. Uh, And we note that that there were several justices who dissented in West versus Gibson, uh, West versus Gibson, noting that the words appropriate relief seem to indicate equitable discretion, uh, uh, discretion and therefore equitable relief. In addition, we'll note that the words appropriate relief in for but equity a, permits money as well. Equity permits money as well. In some limited formats, but it wouldn't be compensatory damages in the sense that we're talking about in this case. 
uh, the, the, an additional indication would be the fact that the words appropriate relief aren't just attached to claim. It's attached to both claim or defense. And, of course, it makes no sense to say that you can get money damages by asserting our lupa as a defense. So for all those reasons, the City of Austin might actually have a good case that damages aren't available even against them. Of course, it doesn't matter for our case, because the whole point is if the City of Austin were to lose due to Barnes and Franklin, what we know for sure here is that Barnes and Franklin have nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with the states. If I may, I'll spend a little bit of time on that issue. Well, before you do that, Barnes and Franklin were cases involving implied rights of action, isn't that right? Yes, with the 2007 backdrop, but yes, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, so the, the and, and I, I have this one question may be covered, but can you give me uh, any examples uh, where states have turned down money under the spending clause, say we don't want it, the restrictions are too great? Does this happen all the time or ever? Where states turn down money? The states tell the federal government, no, thank you, we don't want the money. It's starting to happen in Texas. <laughs> Under, under programs like this? I, I don't — I can't think of a situation where Texas has turned down our LUPA federal prison money. Uh, but there and, are and I mean other states. They say, oh, the liabilities are just too great. We don't want it. I'm not aware of any state in the country that has turned down federal prison funds. Of course, if, if damages were somehow inflicted, if Congress changed the law, perhaps states would, would start to, to re, recalibrate that decision. Their core argument is that we should just extend Franklin and Barnes to states. The fatal flaw with that argument is that the very principle on which Franklin and Barnes apply uh, are, are, are premised, that principle does not apply to sovereigns. When Congress passes a cause of action and is silent or ambiguous with respect to uh, the remedies, uh, there's a traditional presu presumption that we apply. Non-sovereigns now expect uh, to be subject to any possible remedy under the sun. Precisely the opposite rule applies to sovereigns. We know that for sure as a, as a matter of precedent in Lane, which rejected Franklin as applied to sovereign. But we also know this as a, a more fundamental basic principle of sovereign immunity. Because when it comes to sovereigns, we have to have not only a clear waiver, but also a waiver that is specific to the remedy that is being sought. These two rules can't be reconciled. Uh, you either can apply the traditional presumption of all remedies, or you apply the, the other rule that sovereigns benefit from. Uh, a petitioner claims that, that maybe a special rule should apply that's unique to the spending clause, that maybe that's a way to get around uh, the, the sovereign immunity problem. But we submit that fundamentally misreads Franklin and Barnes, because what's doing the work in Franklin and Barnes isn't the spending clause. It's actually quite the opposite. Uh, the spending clause is cutting back against the traditional presumption. In Franklin, I'll take each case in turn. In Franklin, you see pages and pages of analysis in, I think, Section 2 of the opinion, where there's exhaustive research about Bell versus Hood and the traditional presumptions that the Court has applied for decades under any font of Federal power. The Spending Clause makes an appearance in Franklin only at the very end in Section 4, invoked by the defense as a potential reason not to apply the traditional presumption. The Court, you know, gets past that on the ground that the traditional presumption is so strong that it does provide the clarity for non-sovereigns. It doesn't — it indisputably applies to non-sovereigns. Why not apply it under the spending clause as well? The point, though, is it's not the spending clause that does the work. It is uh, — it, it is the traditional presumption. That has even more dramatic force in Barnes versus Gorman. Mr. Gorman would have had a $1.2 million punitive damage award that he would have been entitled to except for the fact that this is a spending clause uh, case. And that's precisely why he lost that punitive da damage award. So put simply, yes, uh, it could be that under, under Barnes and Franklin, uh, remedies would be clear enough uh, in that one context. The problem is it's not clear enough in this context because sovereigns present a completely different constitutional context. Uh, I want to address very quickly uh, Justice Sotomayor's question about ex parte Young. I think you were exactly right that, ex parte, that, that our reading isn't in any way redundant with ex parte Young, but I want to note a, an additional reason why we're not redundant. We need to confirm, or Congress needed to confirm, that there was, in fact, a privately enforceable right. And that's why our reading in no way 
uh, renders the ex parte young concept uh, redundant. Uh, what, do, what do you do with the uh, practical problem that's been brought up that if the state is sued, it can release <coughs> the prisoner, it can transfer the prisoner, and then no relief is appropriate? That the only way that the state is going to take its obligation seriously is if it's exposed to compensatory d- damages. If a prisoner is transferred, released, or if the state simply changes its mind, gives up, uh, provides the accommodation, in all those situations, the prisoner is no longer suffering from the complaint of condition. And that's why this Court's mootness doctrines would apply. Put another way, mootness is really just another word for settlement. Uh, and we would think that settlement, the state essentially capitulating and saying, you know, our bad, we should have complied, we should have provided the accommodation, that actually vindicates the purpose uh, of our loop. And indeed, it avoids the need for costly litigation uh, to do so. Uh, I want to mention briefly the U.S. cause What's of action. What's the inducement to do it more quickly rather than to delay? The, the, to, to remedy the wrong faster rather than to delay? The, the, the reason to do it mm-hmm. is it's simply to avoid litigation. I mean, the way this works practically on the ground, prisons obviously have a lot to deal with, a lot of security concerns. They set general policies. They may not be aware that their policy might have an implication for a certain individual of a particular faith. If that's brought to their attention, and, 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 and the, the, the — That's an ideal world that they'll respond, but there's an allegation that some prisons wait till the eve of the trial after onerous discovery on the plaintiff and after um, enormous harm to plaintiffs, physical and otherwise, before they capitulate. So what's the inducement? Well, the inducement is to — To move faster. States are are, uh, suffering the litigation costs as well. We're not in the business to litigate just because we want to. We have plenty of other suits to deal with. This very case, I think, is a good example. Once the prisoner — once Mr. Sossaman grieved with respect to the cell restriction policy, we immediately abandoned that policy before litigation was even filed. Uh, with respect to uh, the U.S. cause of action provision, there was an argument that uh, appropriate relief has to mean damages, because otherwise just take that declaratory or injunctive relief language and put it into the private cause of action. The reason that argument doesn't work is because these are two fundamentally different provisions. There's 4F of RIFRA, which is the U.S. cause of action, and there's 4A of, I'm sorry, of our LUPA, and there's 4A of our LUPA, which is not just a private cause of action, but also a defense. So, again, if you can imagine sticking in the words declaratory injunctive relief and putting it right into 4A, it doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense, because what person asserting a defense would seek an injunctive relief? If you take is this, let me ask to get this information from you. Um, as I understand it, there are some cases that define the words appropriate relief in a statute to include damages. And there's some that don't. Let's look at the ones that don't. There are some where it's pretty hard to do it because it's in a heading called injunction. And that's obvious. But there are only two statutes, really, where the courts have ever held in significant numbers that the word appropriate relief does not include money damages. One is uh, the uh, IDEA the uh, Disabilities Act, and the other is RIFRA. Is there anything else that you've come across? Those are two great examples. Yeah, but are there any other? I mean, those, I just want to get down on a piece of paper what I have to look at. Sure. I think those are two, two great examples. Right. I would note. So you don't have any others, I'm judging from your hesitation. Well, no, I would actually, I would note there are two other cases what? that I would uh, refer you to all, and they're, of course, discussed in the briefs. West versus Gibson which talks about how the words appropriate relief, I think it's remedies in that context, uh, by definition have no fixed meaning. They can't, can't possibly have fixed meaning, so it would have to enlarge or contract. And prior to 1991, uh, prior to the 1991 amendment at issue in that case, the Court unanimously agreed that appropriate relief would not have included money damages. Ruckel's House uh, provides uh, similar guidance in that I think the, the phrase was there was no possible, uh, no comprehensible or principled meaning to the phrase appropriate as attached to a remedy. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly touch on the, the 2000 E7 issue, uh, unless there are questions about that. Assuming the issue is even preserved for this Court's consideration, uh, 2000 E7 doesn't allow relief either. I think there are a lot of reasons why that would be so, but I think the simplest 
is simply to acknowledge the difference between Section 2 of our LUPA and Section 3. Section 2 of our LUPA is much like the four provisions expressly enumerated in 2007, in that all of them have the word discrimination and, more importantly, turn on the concept of discrimination. A discrimination is an element of a cause of action under Section 2 or under any of the four provisions enumerated. By contrast, Section 3 is not. You can have discrimination as, a, as part of your fact pattern if you want, but it will have nothing whatsoever to do with whether you have a valid Section 3 claim or not. You, you've already addressed this, but I take it their posi the position of uh, your friends on the other side of the case is that with the spending clause you have a contract. The state has some extra protections, and therefore uh, we need not be quite so strict uh, in in construing waivers waivers of immunity because you have the contract. Um, can you comment on that argument? Oh, and. Uh, and, and you might want to say that the spending clause uh, is potentially so sweeping that the state should have special protection and we should be particularly careful about the uh, clear statement rule. Or do you think the clear statement rule applies uh, with equal force, whether it's a spending clause or a direct re regulation under, say, the 14th Amendment? I'll try to take each of those points in turn. Uh, we don't see anything in the law that suggests that sometimes there's a clear statement rule and sometimes there's a super-duper clear statement rule. I think there's been some, some suggestion or uh, maybe there has not been anymore. I'm not sure. I read the briefs, I think, the same way that the justices did. But they seem not to be arguing that anymore. Uh, so it should be the same standard. Uh, I, I, I certainly acknowledge that when it comes to the spending clause, as you wrote in your dissent in uh, Davis versus Monroe, that the spending clause, of anything, does raise special constitutional considerations as a general matter, in as much as the spending clause could be used to impose federal restrictions on states that they could never dream of under Article I otherwise. Our loop, of course, is a prime example of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, the spending clause is not doing any work with regard to providing an assumption or a presumption of remedies. Uh, again, is exactly precisely the opposite. Franklin and Barnes both articulate that it's the traditional presumption that applies to any exercise of federal power. That traditional presumption is what's doing the work. The spending clause, if anything, is a cutback. So the notion that just invoking the spending clause suddenly puts states on this uh, fabulously clear notice, I think, just does not work. If there are no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Thank you. Mr. Russell, you have four minutes remaining. Uh, thank you. Nearly every argument uh, the state made here today could have been made uh, by the local governments and barns, ranging from the, the complaint that the, the language like appropriate relief is, is too unclear uh, to the assertion uh, that they were not on notice, uh, that by accepting federal funds they were subjecting themselves to suit. And that's because the local governments, like any other state, have the same right to the same clear statement rule. Unless this Court is, in fact, going to create a proliferation a uh, hierarchy of clear statement rules. Uh, the Pennhurst rule that applies in the spending clause context to local governments applies in exactly the same way to a state government under the 11th Amendment. And, and, and uh, Barnes, this Court construed the express private right of action under Section 504, which incorporated by reference the remedies available under Title VI, which this Court construed to authorize appropriate relief, exactly the same uh, remedy that RELUPA authorizes. And so, the state for the first time today has suggested that the city of Austin is not bound by Barnes. I don't see how uh, they can reach that conclusion. Barnes quite clearly says that a, the local government is uh, subject to, uh, is on notice, that it has clear, there's a clear statement in every spending clause statute uh, that they're subject to a damages remedy so long as they accept the funds because of the contractual nature of the obligation. That applies. Uh, Was that contested in Barnes? Uh, which part? I'm sorry. <clears throat> Was the uh, liability for compensatory damages contested in Barnes? No. The question in Barnes was punitive. Just damages. punitive. And there's a lot of discussion. Uh, the, the assumption that uh, uh, that they were liable for compensatory, but it really wasn't uh, litigated, was it? Well, the legal principle this court adopted to resolve that that issue. Uh, was one that I, I take it was not just a principle for that case, but that in general. Uh, Funding recipients are on notice that they're subject to contract remedies. 
And, and unless this Court is going to back away from that as a general matter, unless the Court's going to say uh, that Pennhurst applies differently in the spending clause context than it does in the sovereign immunity context, I don't see how you can come to a different result in this case. Justice Breyer, with respect to RIFRA, as far as I know, there's only one Court of Appeals case that says the United States is not subject to suits, and that was decided six years after RELUPA uh, was enacted. Uh, with respect to the IDEA, there are a handful of lower courts' decisions that say damages aren't available. Those, uh, that they give reasons that are specific to the IDEA and the fact that that remedial provision is part of the due process hearing process there. In general, damages are the quintessential appropriate relief for, for violations of civil rights, uh, and there's no reason to think that Congress was creating in RELUPA a second-class civil right that wasn't uh, deserving of a make-whole remedy that Congress has provided, even against states in every other context. With respect to the state's belief that the 11th Amendment somehow prefers injunctions over damages remedies, as, as Counsel for the United States pointed out, the 11th Amendment has is no basis for that. It, it treats uh, injunctions and damages as equally offensive to state sovereignty. And, in fact, particularly in RELUPA, uh, where damages are often capped significantly by the PLRA, uh, that the concern really ought to be on the state's part by injunctive relief, which will frequently have a much more significant effect on the public fist uh, than a small damages award. Board. And finally, with respect to the state's argument that the word uh, appropriate relief are too inherently ambiguous to meet any clear statement rule, this court rejected that kind of argument in West, uh, where it construed appropriate remedy uh, to, to encompass a damages remedy by engaging in ordinary statutory interpretation, uh, which uh, is entirely appropriate in this conduct. Uh, this court has repeatedly, in cases like uh, Ruckel's House, for example, like Richland, uh, relied on how statutes apply uh, with respect to private parties to give meaning to the otherwise ambiguous word appropriate uh, in a federal uh, statute waiving the federal government's sovereign immunity. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted.